Okay. I'm going to go ahead and start recording on Zoom as well. It's kind of two different ways of recording. Hello, everybody. If you're just joining us, if you're joining us on Facebook, uh, record to the cloud. There we go. So anybody want to share where you're from? What? Um. Or why does someone go first? Because I'm still trying to find files. If that's okay. Sure. I'm I'm John Shell. I'm here from Biodiversity for a Livable Climate, and I'm also organizing the Eco Restoration Alliance. I'm in Rochester, New York. Okay. Uh, my name is Robert. Kurt, right? I used to be um, a member of active member of biodiversity for a livable climate also and uh, and um, live in Boston and uh, I make compost and I follow climate. Uh, my name is Rob Lewis. I am also uh, with biodiversity for livable climate. Uh, I'm a poet and essayist and um, a citizen here in Bow, Washington. Excellent. I'm Lucy Tracy. I've also, I, well, probably about four years ago, I've, I've helped with putting conferences on for biodiversity um, for livable climate also. Um, with a contact with Philip Bogdanoff. So, and I'm a weaver. I'm part of an artist co-op in Bar Harbor, Maine. Who else wants to get, wants to, has everybody introduced themselves? Everybody but you, Hart. Okay, I'm, I'm Hart. I guess I'm, um, I'm the host of Water and Climate. I learned about water and climate earlier this year. I've been reporting on climate for three years, but I learned about the new water paradigm in March when I read Judith Schwartz's book, Cows Save the Planet. Chapter four is um, the new or uh, the return of lost water. And I want to share a few things that um, just just a few principles that I think most of us can agree on. Uh, uh, principles related to water. And here it is. So beliefs and principles related to water and climate. Water has a tremendous cooling effect when it evaporates. So we need to harness the power of water and cool in cooling the climate. Water operates within ecosystems. Uh, we need to restore water cycles by harvesting rainwater, letting plants grow, nurturing healthy soils, and sometimes employing earthworks like swales and small dams. Uh, we need to let plant matter grow. We need to grow more, mow less, cut less. Uh, our, it, our main critique of the mainstream climate movement is that, is that it's hyper-focused on carbon dioxide and, and not enough focused on living systems. Of course, of course, of course, carbon dioxide is a problem, but a fact out of context is a lie. And we, there's, there's uh, speaking only for myself, I think the, the, the emphasis on carbon dioxide is so obsessive that it's misleading. Uh, so we believe the climate movement needs to take a holistic approach, consider all factors, not just isolated factors like carbon dioxide. And uh, so today we have Rob Lewis, and he's going to be presenting a presentation called Standing on One Leg, Looking Through One Eye, How Orthodox Climate Science, uh, the Left Hand Health Canada. Delicious! out of the uh, climate equation. Now, let me see. We have some background noise here. And I need to, okay. All right, so I'm gonna introduce Rob 
and then Rob will will share uh, his screen and we'll go from there. So through poems, essays and activism, Rob Lewis works to bring the power of language to the defense of the more than human world. As owner of Earthcraft Painting, he also works to revive the use of local wild clays to paint our work and living spaces. He is author of the poem essay collection, The Silence of Vanishing Things, and serves on the leadership committee for biodiversity for a livable climate. So let's welcome Rob Lewis. Rob, thank you so much for joining us and, and volunteering to present. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me, Hart, and uh, glad to see you all here. Uh, that was a great introduction about um, how we are over-focused on CO2 and under-focused on water and land change. And I just want to give a little background to how we ended up here in this place. Um, so um, I was first introduced to this uh, this dichotomy by Milan, Milan Milan, he's a respected authority on the Mediterranean climate. He's been advisor to the European Union, he even designed the metal detectors that are used in all the world's airports. Um, and his knowledge of land change, uh, deforestation, soil killing ag, urban, suburban, and industrial build out, and its role in the Mediterra Mediterranean climate leads him to speak of a two-legged climate system. One leg CO2 in the greenhouse effect, the other leg being land change via hydrologic disturbance. He recalls a time in the early 1970s when both legs were present in the climate science, referencing an early uh, scientific climate assessment conducted by MIT and the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences called Inadvertent Climate Modification Report of the Man's Report of the Study of Man's Impact on Climate. So I'm going to pull that up so you can just see it. <laughs> okay. Um, are you seeing this? Not yet. <sighs> For some reason, it is not showing everything I've got on my. Okay, guys, I'm sorry, I'll just have to um, wing it. Um, so, um, Rob, if you want, take just, we, we've got time. Take another minute and see if yeah. you can share your screen. No rush, no pressure. Uh, well, I, I have it in my task bar, but when I go to share screen, it doesn't show up. So I, I really let me don't. Let me make you co-host again. I, that might be okay. it. I'm going to go up here and say, uh, prop, um, make host, make host, okay. remove co-host permissions. Uh, I'm gonna remove co-host permissions and then I'm gonna put them back and see if that happens. Make okay. co-host. So I'm gonna make you a co-host and see if you can see a button that says share screen at the bottom. Yeah, I, I have share screen, but I don't have all my documents showing for some reason. Uh, I can. Do you know how files. to do Alt Tab? Do you know how to do Alt Tab on your computer? Like, hold alt. down Alt, and I mean that that can get you to another. Okay. Stop. Okay. Do you see it now? Alt Tab. Okay. So, how about this? Do you see it? Not yet. No? I see it. I don't know. <laughs> so, so now is when you need to share your screen, I think. Well, I'm trying. I'm trying to share my screen. It shows. I'm just going to have to wing it. For some reason, it will not pull up the documents I am trying to pull up. Um, it's only showing a fraction of the documents I have here. So. Uh, so I'm just going to explain it. So this that, book. That's fine. That's fine. Let's do yeah, it. Yeah, this, this book was written um, in 1971. And uh, basically, um, it was one of the earliest uh, attempts of scientists around the world to really get a handle on climate change. And uh, its table of contents and the entire contents of the book are roughly half land change 
and half CO2. And, and that was the point I was trying to make is that uh, when I say I'm the, the phrase standing on one leg comes from that, that uh, this older scientist remembers a two-legged view of climate, CO2 and land change, meaning hydrology and, and, and uh, vegetation loss. And then it was, then that became almost purely um, about CO2. So uh, we lost one of the legs. That's how we ended up standing on one leg. And then uh, in terms of the science, there are two branches, or in terms of um, looking through one eye, uh, there are two branches of science, uh, the physical sciences, which is uh, physics, and the biological science, which is biology. But if you look at the, um, Let's see if this comes up. Did this come up? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. there you have it. AR6 Climate Change 2021, the physical science basis. And this has been the case for all their uh, assessment reports going back to 1988. And, and the group that produces the IPC assessments, working group one is called the physical science basis. And here they say, addresses the most up-to-date physical understanding of the climate system. So we're not looking through both lenses. We're just looking through physics. And nobody mentions that. You know, we have all these climate reporters, you know, a, a whole new uh, generation of climate journalists. Not one seems to have noticed this, that what we're calling the science is actually the physics. So, and we know what happens when you look through the, the biological lens, you see forest, you see uh, environmental, uh, um, ET, you know, um, transpiration, evapotranspiration. So I'm just trying to point out how we got here. And um, one of the things um, that I noticed, uh, 1974, do you see this? This was a report that came out uh, in, by the National Academy of Sciences called Understanding Climate Change. And in this report, produced only three years later, there's no mention of land change. It's all CO2. And you can see some of the wording here. You know, in this, um, in this report, the US Committee of the Global Atmospheric Research Program, which is part of the Academy of Sciences, outlines a program to understand the physical forces. Later on in the foreword says, Meteorological satellites allow us to monitor these parameters that we now believe control the climate machine. The sun's output, the Earth's albedo, reflectiveness, the distribution of clouds, ice and snow, temperatures of the upper layer of the ocean. They say these parameters control the average state of the weather and thus the climate. So a couple of things here, uh, climate machine, very old thinking, that, mm. that doesn't apply to all to what we know about the climate. And there's no life here. There's no biosphere. And then assuming that weather and climate are, are the same thing, I, I don't think that works at all. I, uh, I think of it as the metaphor of like a smoker. So if somebody is smoking and they blow out a puff of smoke, the physics can follow that puff for, let's say a week's worth of weather or 10 days worth of weather. They, they can through physical equations, really follow what's going to happen with the fluid dynamics of that smoke. But they don't tell you anything about the smoker. And that's the climate, and that's Mother Earth. Mother Earth creates the climate. And uh, if she's not healthy, she's not even going to be blowing the smoke, you know. So um, I question this. I don't have enough knowledge, you know, to really take that apart. But that's one thing that I think does need to be looked into more deeply. And then uh, lastly, but far, and this also is from the introduction or preface, lastly, but far from least, there's a new generation of atmospheric scientists. Their tools are the computer, numeric models, and satellites, and they know how to use them well. The USC GARP believes this is an adequate manpower base. And there you see it again. I mean, these, these are the guys in the room with the big brains and the big computers and the big toys. 
and they just decided they they had they had control of the of the whole narrative and knew what was going on and somehow managed to miss life and water <laughs> so uh where this took us eventually practically speaking is here and this is the ipcc report and this graph shows they call it effective radiati radiative forcing i think they mean warming 1750 to 2019 that's the entire industrial period that's the colonial era that's um the 1800s lady and also uh, the whole petroleum era, the great acceleration, uh, all the logging, all the land cleared for agriculture, uh, the extermination of buffalo, um, dung beetles, prairie dogs, all those critical animals for hydrology, the ruination of almost all prairies over the whole world, the creation of vast desert, and according to them, those land use changes created a mild cooling. Now, how did they get to that? Well, they only look at albedo. They don't look at evapotranspiration because it's, it's too complicated. Uh, it's too hard to model. It's, um, they can't put it in their computer models. So rather than uh, explaining that and making that clear in their graph, they just chose to pretend it wasn't there. And you also see how critical this number is to this number. This number were to go up like we know it certainly does, this number goes down. And I'm not making accusations here. And I realize uh, it's very hard for the IPCC to even make this argument, but it does strike me as interesting how uh, easily they allowed this to go without notice when we all know this is very significant. Um, so that basically, is the presentation my feeling about this is this Rob, is... can i ask you something it, um I, I i got a little bit lost can you just kind of break it down like what numbers are we talking about here on this graph uh -huh. okay yeah okay so effective radiated forcing is just warming and 1750 to 2019 and these are all the causes of the warming here's degree centigrade so from 1750 to 2019, this graph shows carbon dioxide is causing about uh, 2.25 degrees Celsius of warming. Uh, other greenhouse gases, such as methane and nitrous oxide, you know, somewhere around one degree. Ozone, less than one degree. And then land use, about negative two degrees a cooling so um and this this graph was originally produced by michael mann uh and i i don't have uh that graph or that report that was an older report but basically he used equations from someone they knew who he knew to uh basically combine albedo with carbon sequestration to come with the ultimate number. Um, so they, you know, the IPCC does look at carbon sequestration and that's what this number is based on. So carbon sequestration um, lost because of all this land damage would probably maybe show up like, you know, here this much, but when you add the albedo, and by albedo, they mean reflectiveness. So a dark forest absorbs more heat, therefore it is warmer, according to this way of calculating. So when all that land was cleared, it represented a cooling. So even though they acknowledge that destroying land probably heated the atmosphere to some degree, the albedo, the high reflectivity of bare land cooled it enough to result in uh, overall cooling. So I just wanted people to understand that. I think this is very problematic. Um, and I've talked to uh, other uh, scientists. Uh, this one scientist I spoke with, um, put it this way. Uh, in the old days, it was carbon sequestration plus albedo 
generally comes to the finding that land use change creates a net cooling. The more recent literature since 2015 or so has carbon sequestration plus albedo plus ET. They're starting to add this in and clouds and that creates a net cooling. But because the IPCC is a consensus-based organization and there's peer review, it hasn't gotten into the report yet. So uh, because of the process, we're not considering what we understand to be the most significant aspect of the climate. And you know, when I talked to the scientist, he was, you know, he's like, I, I see I see the problem, but as a scientist, he understands that it'll eventually get corrected. And he's still uh, a fan of the IPCC. Um, but why should we have to wait uh, for the IPCC to figure out what we already know is true from past experience, from our own senses, you know, and we're out uh, in places that are either green and cool or bare and dry and hot. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the presentation. I would like to have shown you those, those table of contents, but uh, I won't, oh, wait a minute. Here we go. I don't know how that showed up, but so uh, this is one page from the table of contents. Major conclusions and recommendations, effects of man-made surface change, modification of the troposphere, modification of the stratosphere, these things are CO2. But you know, you can see they have a fairly equal orientation to the, the, the land change. And this is that book from 1970, right? Yes. Now are you seeing this second page? It's folded out. Or are you still seeing the first page? Still seeing the first page. first page. Okay, yeah, that's it's messing with me. So anyway, that gives you an example. I don't I don't know why the other table of contents is not showing up, but it's not. Wait a minute, there it is all of a sudden. Okay, well here we go. Maybe it had to just find it. So here's the second page. Man's activities influencing climate land surface alterations, mm -hmm. surfacing underground water, um, and then um, page three of the, wait a minute. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not bringing up that page. Uh, but anyways, it's a similar story on the other, uh, you know, they show a rough, a rough equal, a roughly equal uh, consideration of land change and climate change. Brian Cartwright raised his hand. Brian, you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, Rob, does this imply what you were saying about uh, the relationship of albedo with uh, with forests. Um, if those were the only considerations, then you would be able to say that deforestation is good for the climate. Yes, you would. <laughs> but right. Although there's that's, the element, the there's the element of car there's carbon uh, right. lost, of course. Yeah. So um, I'm not saying that climate scientists would agree, but in terms of land use, um, that would be yep. the implication. That is the implication. Yeah. The implication is almost we're better with dead land than living land because it absorbs less yeah. solar energy, um, which is obviously problematic. Also, I mean, in general, it, it, thanks for a very nice presentation. Is this 1974, the document that you're showing? That's 71. Wow. 1970, 71. Yeah. Oh so that's that's that very early, very early science of, and not early science. You know, the science goes back to the 1800s, but I would call this one of the very earliest attempts at a consensus uh, assessment by many scientists spread around. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the um, 
This was produced by MIT and the Swedish Academy of Sciences. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, in general, Rob, I, we have yeah, a, uh, John Scholl has raised his hand, but first, okay. why don't you stop the screen share so we okay. can talk? I think that that would be a good thing at this point. Okay, I hope I can figure out. <laughs> I think I just get rid of it. Oh, you're figuring that out. Is it out. gone? Did I stop still it? Still there, still there. What about that? On? Uh, hard. If you retract uh, hostage, okay. that, the screen share idea. will go away. Let me see. It uh, says my screen share is paused. Uh, stop share. There we go. Sorry. There we go. All right. <laughs> this is my first attempt at this, so <laughs> figuring it out. Okay, John. Um, so, you know, you, you've got a really good who done it here except you haven't asked the question who did it um you've shown that there's a smoking gun in 1971 between 1971 and 1974 um during okay. which time the biological leg was amputated well there must have been some kind of good way to put it there must have been some kind of Flash editorial wing. decision or politics or something else going on there with is. those particular people in those particular years. Now, I'm not interested in playing the blame game, but it's it's there's a really interesting story to be told if you can talk to those people and figure out what led to the demise of the biological perspective within the IPCC. Well, um, yeah, I can answer that. Uh, the uh, report I mentioned in 1974 by uh, the Global Atmospheric Research Program uh, that was a global program which the U.S. dominated by virtue of our computer ability. You know, we were just at the point where we were really able to predict weather. Uh, computers, what a, what a computer model does is it takes the entire atmosphere and puts it into little sections. And then each of those sections is subjected to all of the physical laws of conservation of mass, yada, yada huge amount of mathematics that computers came along and were able to crunch into a single machine. Otherwise, you'd need a, a stadium full of mathematicians. So and the US led that effort. So we kind of ran weather modific or weather uh, understanding. And um, I just think the power of that, the, the power of the physics just kind of took over. And there was another thing. I mean. One thing I want to be clear about is I'm really not pointing fing fingers or blaming because one of the things that faced scientists of that age is the government was starting to ask questions. What do we do about CO2 concentrations? And the only way they could answer that question was to put everything else to the side. They, they, they couldn't measure evapotranspiration, put it as a constant. They couldn't measure uh, ecological processes in the complexity of those systems. Put it aside, assume it doesn't affect it. We'll just focus on CO2. We can give the president a report and you know, we can give Congress a report. This happened over and over. Uh, 1979, uh, when the Charney report came out, which was um, produced by um, oh, a fairly elite group of scientists, um, it was 30 pages long compared to what like uh, the, the uh, World Meteorological Association, when they produced their climate reports, they were 700 pages long. They looked at all this stuff. You know, the Charney report just brought it down to like 39 words and said it was all carbon. And uh, the government was asking for something and that's, they got something. And that was used to basically bolster the entire argument about CO2. Uh, and then in 1988 was when the IPCC was formed. And by now the physical basis was pretty much locked in. But what was interesting was at the same time that the IPCC was formed, they formed the IBGP, which is the International Biosphere Geosphere Program. And that was looking at uh, James Lovelock's theory of Gaia. And they called the earth systems or planetary change or global change. So it's kind of like, well, that side got stuck with that. The water, the biological was 
put on them, but one, they weren't even allowed to say climate change. They had to frame all their, all their research in terms of global change, which doesn't really mean much. Uh, they were given a 10th of the funding and in 2015, they were dissolved and privatized into a thing called Future Earth. So yeah, it is kind of a whodunit. And um, I'm kind of animated because I've been sitting on this for months, just going, how do I get this information out? Uh, it's certainly a, a, a future essay, but it's so huge, it's hard to get my head around and to write around. And just, I'm really glad that Hart's given me the opportunity just to bring it all out in this more informal setting. Let me share with you, I, I wrote down some notes. Th this is Hart Hagen's version of you know, why, why is the, why do, why are we not, um, why are we focused on greenhouse gases as opposed to water ecosystems and land use? Uh, so number one, it, it's difficult to put, it, it, it's difficult to mathematically model water ecosystems and land use. For one thing, water, water and ecosystems are just, they're different in different places. I think it could be modeled. I really do. Well, they're starting some, to. Make they're some assumptions. To. It could be done, but, yeah. uh, but, it, but that's one reason. Another reason is that Rob, like a, a light bulb came on with me. I was a math major and then I passed a couple of actuary oh, that's exams. that's right, yeah. And I, uh, I remember studying for an actuary exam and going through, I would, I would get together with a friend of mine and we would just have a blast solving math problems. It lends itself to collaboration. You can see if you've got to the end or not. You can see, talk about the steps along the way. And uh -huh. I think that the fact that scientists are dealing with a model lends itself to worldwide collaboration yes. such that yep. you can't quite achieve if you're not doing the math. If you're That's if you're not point. involved in a mathematical model, thirdly, That's a really good point. Uh, thank you. Thirdly, the the, the um, you know the the military industrial complex dominates science, uh, and and it and it's focused on physics and chemistry, uh, and and computer technology more than life sciences. Right. And, um, so in the military industrial complex means a couple of things. One, it means it, well, it, it means the physical sciences and it also means commercialism. I mean, the purpose of the military industrial complex is profit. It's not defense. It's, it's, it, it's, it's tr uh, ongoing transfer of wealth from the many to the few. And you, you, you come up with a lot of profitable applications you come up with a lot well, of applications that make, that's, that make money that's really interesting because uh the the people who uh produced the charney report the report that the charney report was based on were from uh, the jason group which is a, a elite group of science which does Marvel. a lot of science mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. for the department of defense mm -hmm. so that's a really interesting link that you bring up yeah and there's a book i have one other point but there's a book called the tragedy of american science which is a really good history of, of how the military industrial complex came to dominate and what that means, how it works, uh, uh -huh. how, how it might be changed, how, how we might take it back. Uh, but fourth, um, it's like Milan Mon says, you can talk about CO2 for decades and not do anything <laughs> about it. Yeah. You know, to me, when we focus on the atmosphere instead of land use, it allows a multitude of culprits to hide in plain sight. Oh, it's yeah. what's coming out of our tailpipes or it's what's coming out of the uh, power plant that's somewhere. Uh, and it's also a kind of a technical problem instead of, a, it, you know, to me, the, yeah. the challenges we have have to do with social organization and priorities and governance. How that's basically right. fundamentally do we make decisions, not just the technical problem. We're, we're basically good. We're just generating energy the wrong way. We need to generate energy a different way. Yeah. So it's been reduced to that, allows a multitude of culprits to hide in plain sight. Yeah. And and then, know, if it's land use, then wow, everywhere you look, you got government and commercial interests yes. that yep. are 
using right. the land, altering the <laughs> land. The, the, the right. United Nations says that um, like changes in land use is the one of the one of the leading causes of the decline in biodiversity. So yeah. I've thought about changes in land use. So it's almost like whenever humans are changing the use of land, they're changing it for the world. It could be different. It could be better. Yeah. It's like humans could have a positive impact on the land. We don't yeah. have to be a drain on this planet. It's like cows, uh, you know, cows can be bad or good. It depends on, it just depends. Yeah. So we're, we're not, it's not fate that we yeah. should, I mean, right now I, I'm, I'm, temp, I'm tempted to say we're a freaking disgusting species, <laughs> but, but, it, 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 but it, it, it doesn't have to be that way. And it has almost, in my view, my humble opinion has almost nothing to do with population. I do not buy that population per se is an issue it's because our, for one thing, our biomass is so small compared to ants you know, or insects, there's a whole lot more biomass there, you know, so anyway, but I digress. Uh, Brian has his hand up, I think. Okay, please, please save me, save okay. me from this rant. No, no I, I really like what you're saying. And, and as far as population, briefly, uh, if, if the humans on earth were a bigger proportion of us were acting as stewards, we could, rather than just consumers and destroyers, we could, um, uh, turn things around. We, uh, I think we all believe that. Now, I wonder always why these issues we're talking about are not more prominent and why they don't catch on more than they are catching on. I mean, maybe they are, but um, I would think that in these days well, where you have, it seems like the pressure is building and uh, mm -hmm. the, the climate change crisis is more perceived as a crisis by more people and the uh the story that it that the only thing we can do is cut co2 is becoming more widely accepted uh in spite of uh you know the efforts of fossil fuel industry to, to contradict it or to or to deceive people why wouldn't they catch on and say well look i understand that CO2 is not the only problem and um, that there are other things we can do. Therefore, maybe we don't have to reduce our emissions so quickly, which is kind of the technique that's been going on for a long time of just delaying that change. It goes on for decades. Um, so, so why is this happening? Is that your question? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a great question. We're all kind of wondering that. And uh, I know someone who knows Bill McKibben, and she asked him something like that, you know, given the power of regeneration and, and why, why aren't you focusing on that? And his answer was very strategic. He wanted to keep the focus on CO2. They were just about there. They were about to, you know, really give it to the, um, to the fossil fuel industry. And um, I think that's one of the reasons is I do think this climate movement is very elitely run and decisions are being made about what can and can't be done. There's also um, this great desire in environmentalism to, to make, to break that uh, thing of jobs versus environment. You know, this gives them the chance to say, oh, we can create jobs, we can have high industry all over the place and it's good for the planet because it's creating green technology. And unfortunately that's not true. It's always bad, almost always bad for the climate when you do heavy industry. So there's, it's a lot of politics, I think. Unfortunately, it's the worst, it's, it's a really ugly side of politics. I think that's mostly why. I saw a kind of amazing thing uh, the other day. You probably, most of us have seen um, Paul Hawkins' new book called Regeneration. Mm -hmm. I haven't and, seen it yet. Uh, oh, it's really good. It's very, it's very thorough in, as is his style. Um, in kind of encyclopedic about the different ways that we can regenerate and, and turn the climate around in a generation is what he's saying. Um, but, uh, but I was amazed because I saw a good review of that book from Michael Mann. And he was saying, this is great. These are the things we all need to be doing. And so I, I commented on Twitter, gee, I'm truly puzzled. 
if he believes these are the things we are doing, why does his latest book not mention them with one word of I anything think he's been other? Caught -footed. I think a lot of these people just, they, they saw the physical basis. And if you just look at the physical basis, it's so terrifying. You know, we have no <laughs> source of power at all in that basis that it can, it can really mess with your mind. I think mm -hmm. a lot of this is just trauma, <laughs> kind of, you know, they're not thinking clearly. Um, and they were, you know, Michael Mann is an astrophysicist. He came to the climate from another planet. Matter of <laughs> uh, he comes to the earth he hits atmosphere first he thinks oh this is the climate and then and then he has the supposition that all the damage is coming downward from the atmosphere onto the earth causing biodiversity loss and such whereas it's the opposite biodiversity loss happens down at the earth and rises to the climate which i think of as like a balloon blown up by life living so you start to destroy life, that balloon begins to sag, can no longer really function. Um, Steve Bonnewell has his hand up. Hi, Steve. Hi, Rob. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the, thanks for the presentation. Um, very interesting how it's gone astray. I think um, partly, as well as vested interests, which obviously shape the way things go. They've got a lot of influence. I think there's also a, um, a misunderstanding in the general public in a huge percentage of people. They don't realize that our weather and biology and soils are all dynamic. They're all coming from a sustainable paradigm. We start at a certain point and it just gets worse because humanity does that. They don't realize the ability to regenerate that with our knowledge of natural processes, we can um, have systems beyond what nature has expressed before. Um, so I think that's a, a massive part of the paradigm as well. And that's what mm -hmm. we've got to get out and share all these amazing projects around the world that are have documented um, data of changing weather systems like um, Willie Smith's in Borneo, um, in, the, in the rainforest there and other things. Um, yeah, and another um, brief comment is um, very valuable, the Water and Climate um, Facebook group, because um, uh, Antonio Nobre made the, of, um, the biotic pump, he's a climatologist in Brazil. He was right. making the point that we have, all, we have all these specialists, but they're all disconnected. What we need now is general. <laughs> we need to <laughs> collate. One yeah, jack collate of all, all trades insight. coming up. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's right. And, and even just people making broad sweeping statements that, that as um, Hart says, intuitively makes sense, you know, mm -hmm. biotic pump theory, moisture comes in, um, yeah. bioprecipitation, um, mm -hmm. like a desert going all the way to the coast, just say hypothetically that was vegetated. You could present that to someone who's coming from a carbon paradigm and say, what if that was vegetated? What would happen on that desert right on the coast? You know, it, it would completely transform. Yeah. So I think the case is pretty easy to make. And I think um, the dynamic nature of biology and life systems is something that we really need to emphasize. And this group does a great job of doing that. Yeah, uh, you mentioned people don't seem to understand it. And I think that's a lot because of climate journalism. You know, they, it, it is a lot of science and they, they stopped leave, at the leave, physical. They just leave it to the farther. experts. You know, it's the, yeah. Leave it to the experts. It's the, the, it's the rule, like since World War II, it's the rule of the technocrats. Mm -hmm. The establishment loves its technocrats. And I think that I've never read it, but there's a book by John Ralston Saul called, uh, Voltaire's Bastards, and I think it deals with that issue, the rise of the technocrats. But it, oh, it's like a experts, a reliance on experts. And you know, you, you gotta, you gotta revere, you gotta revere true expertise. But that can't be a substitute for observation and common sense and dialogue. Because exactly. if yes. you can only be, everybody's ignorant just on different things. If you can only be participate in the conversation by being an expert then that disqualifies a lot of people. 
and and uh, for one and it thing, just disempowers them too. Yeah, right, exactly. So agency is one thing that you know I, I've learned in in this movement early on, like from Judith Schwartz and others in Milan, Milan uh, are are saying that you know this gives us something to do. I mean, to me, rainwater harvesting is a is a major cons major major issue and that by definition it's how much water can I keep on my land and soak into the ground instead of runoff and that by its nature is an acre by it's it's acre by acre and it's also it can include water that we use for personal use and you know one of these days where I'm gonna you know have my gray water running you know soaking into the ground yeah. which can recharge the groundwater and recharge our streams, et cetera. But it, it's localized as opposed to CO2 is homogeneous worldwide. Right. And it's like, I'm one of seven and a half billion people. Yeah, it's like Homer Simpson. Yeah, but what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've been talking about that at Biodiversity for Livable Climate, that uh, the local is where we have our agency. That's where we can actually do things. And uh, one thing I noticed here in Washington State, our governor, Inslee, big on climate, but only on the uh, CO2. He's big on electric cars, uh, windmills, solar, but his own Department of Natural Resources is currently auctioning off major tracts of old mature timber uh, of state land. And, and uh, they're not making the connection mm -hmm. um, and the people don't know. I mean, electric cars, well, do nothing for us here in Washington. None of us will feel that effect ever. But if, if we lose our forests and they really go up in smoke as they seem to be headed, we're all gonna feel it. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that just aren't working out right with this. I call it climatism. It's like its own, its own authority. You, you know? have these, uh, what do you call it? Unintended consequences. Like biomass, uh, it makes up way too much of the so-called renewable energy. Like you get tax credits and the like for renewable energy. Renewable energy includes biomass. The way you get biomass usually is to clear cut a forest, turn it into wood pellets. Quite often you're shipping it to Europe uh, because yep. they get special credits for that. And we're, we're clearing American forests and European and Asian forests <laughs> for, to turn them it's into wood chips. And, and, and that's considered to be renewable energy. And, and when people hear renewable energy, they think solar power, clean, you know, yep. we have these Madison Avenue slick PR images of what solar power is, but a lot of the so-called renewable energy is is biomass and it's causing forests to be clear cut. Yeah, which is clim climatologically incoherent because you're destroying the hydrology. Mm -hmm. And I was reading Bright Green Lies. We, we I, th I think we could get Lear, Keith and or um, oh, you should. This is a and link. or uh, Derek Jensen. I think we could get mm -hmm. them on here, uh, but you know, he, he he's talking like the the accounting, the carbon. Like when you call something carbon neutral, that's an accounting exercise. And yeah. are you accounting? You know, I, you know, are you accounting for the carbon that gets released when you you clear cut a forest, and and you can only clear cut a forest like three times until it's totally dead. Yeah. Um, and, and then, and then at, when you clear cut it, you've got the, the soil ecosystem dies, the fungi dies, the roots die and, and the all that, and not, the hydrology goes away. And, and I don't yeah. think they're even, even if you're carbon centric, I don't think they're accounting for the carbon that gets released when, when you do the clear cutting for wood chips. Yeah. One thing I saw during uh, this auctioning uh, the people who called in in support of it would say things like, oh, well, cutting forests is a great way to lock in carbon because once the tree is put it into a two by four and you put it into a house, the carbon is locked up. So this argument, you know, turning everything into quantities of carbon is not good for life on earth at all. And it's a, it, to me, it's, um, it's just a further dissociation of the human being from nature. We're getting farther and farther away from any real relationship with these other lives. They become just quantities of carbon now. And this is being done by environmentalism. 
Let me that. share with you something that came to mind a while ago. Uh, so it's the idea of why are these issues, so you know this, and I know this, and you know, all of us here know this, but why are, why are these ideas more prominent? So here's, here's my thing. We tend to think that ideas kind of spread organically by osmosis, that there's some kind of free marketplace of ideas. Uh, I don't think it's that way. I think we have a very dysfunctional way of spreading ideas, including spreading the wrong ideas. But like, here's, here's the, the theory of manufacturing consent from Noam Chomsky. Here, here's how the media, the commercial media, the mass media really works. It's like everything gets, gets put through a filter. And it's, the, it's the commercial interests that own and sponsor the media. Anything that's not flattering to them is going to not be shared very much in the commercial media. And it's five factors, five filters. One is ownership, like who owns the media? If it's a big corporation, you know, that, if, you know it, it, who, who owns the media, who sponsors the media? Uh, they also, you know, you wanna preserve your access to corporations and to the government. So it's access journalism. I have to say, if I'm gonna get them to feed me this information, I have to be nice to them. And, it, and uh, there, 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 there's something called flack, which is just this blowback that you get if you say the wrong thing, if you end up on the wrong side of an issue. Yep. And there's something called, I'm calling it uh, the fifth thing. I'm calling it othering. It's used, it used to be 30 years ago, it used to be the religion of anti-communism which, you know, you have to stay on the right side of that. But um, it, so communism kind of is not so much of a thing as much. It, it's still there, but it's also anti-terrorism. And it's also, yeah. it, it's, it's having to unite against a common enemy. And it's what I call, what you might call othering. Like there's an other, and some, to some extent, the other is the, like the other political party, but there's just this constant othering that's going on yeah. uh, that the, all of which disrupts the flow of, of ideas. Yeah. So, and to me, one of the overarching things about that is that, uh, you know, it's the golden rule. Whoever has the gold makes the rules. Whoever <laughs> has the money, uh, it, it ultimately it's hard to investigate people that have money, people and corporations and interests that have money. Yeah. Well, I think you're right. You know, the, the narrative that got through is the narrative that the corporations like. Yeah. They can it's, make money out. It's, for one thing, it's not threatening to them. But for, yeah. for another thing, like you said, it, it, it's, you know, it's a way to make money. It, it, it's also, I'm sorry, I, I'm a bit too conspiratorial for some, but it's a way to control people by fear. I mean, if you if you buy into the carbon narrative, yeah, yeah I mean, I'm sure some really bad things are coming down the road uh, on a, but but there's also a desire to control people without solving the problem that they're supposed to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you mentioned flack. You know, look what happened to um, Gibbs uh, with his. Uh, Planet of the Humans. Great movie, in my opinion. Yeah, we, we should we should allow people here to say uh, if you care to share, but for or against. But I'm I'm sorry to interrupt, Rob. No, but no. I, I, I spent I spent the better part of 2020 covering that movie. I oh, mean, I, I watched the movie. I watched I watched the environmentalist attack the movie. Yeah, and I, I said, Max Blumenthal did did a great nine thousand word article on Planet of the Humans. Really, uh, I, and I'm getting to where if I'm kind of at odds with somebody on the internet, I'll say, "Have you seen Planet of the Humans?" <laughs> and, and, and I and I know that if they attack it, then I'm not going to try to reason with them. I mean, I'm I, yeah. then, then that's just somebody that is getting their information. That's somebody whose mind has been captured and I'm not going to be able to help them with that, you know, so. Well, you might because a lot maybe, of these people uh, have not seen the movie and they've just heard. Yeah, right, know. exactly. Somebody and, on, on one of the Water for Climate posts. And, and here's who's, uh, who's on the wrong side of that issue. Bill McKibben, Naomi Klein, yeah. George Mambio, uh, and the prominent climate activists locally in my yeah. town. We're on the wrong side of that. Hardly anybody 
was on the right side of that in terms of the people that are identified as climate active, identified as environmental. But here's the thing. So they attacked the movie on the basis of supposedly they have old information related to which, related to solar panels, which I think yeah. the Michael Moore, Jeff Gibbs, Ozzy Zenner did a great job of responding to that. But what the critics are not e saying anything about is how the last third of the movie just really shows the corruption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The whole um, financialization of nature is going on. And, you know, there, there probably is some good parts to that. I mean, if someone's got $10 billion and they decide to give a, a billion to regenerative agriculture, I'm not going to stop them, you know, but it keeps us in this same paradigm. We're not breaking out of corporate control. Um, yeah. Something I haven't looked into very much, partly because I'm just not interested in, is that, and that is how much of the infrastructure, you know, what is this infrastructure bill going for? I almost, I almost read an article about that today. And I said, I don't even want to know. I just don't have any confidence that, that they're doing good things with, with that money. All They might be, there might be parts of it that are doing good things, it but be I just best subject for one of your, yeah panels you know i mean right. i would like to know i've tried to get information the green new deal is one of the fuzziest things it's mm -hmm. so hard to nail that thing down uh but um well, it, it's, about it's, it, you know, it's only us. green new deal is only a slogan I, I, there are five green new deals i've read them all uh, i've done hours and hours and hours of programming on my podcast so I, I at least you know in my own way i just i read it read comment read com you know bernie sanders has a green new deal uh green oh, okay. party has a green new deal democratic socialists of america alexander ocasio cortez um okay. uh, what, and uh, there's another one who that, uh, that escapes me and uh i i thought they were you know I, a year and a half ago i thought they were a good thing but then then you learn a little bit. Yeah, th th that was before I knew about the new water paradigm. It's also mm -hmm. before I'd seen Planet of the Humans and seen how corrupt it is. Uh, and, and also, you know, one thing. One thing is, uh, you know, if you if you if you look at Planet of the Humans, if you read Ozzy Zenner, if you read uh, Derek Jensen, Bright Green Lies, you see that there that some of the solar and wind and electric vehicle, they're just, they're, they're just not going to be able to deliver on these glowing promises. Yeah. I, you know, they're finding out it, just to equal what we're used to would take such a, uh, an explosion of industrial growth. And uh, one thing no one talks about, uh, and although Bill McKibben talked about it uh, when he was discussing uh, biofuels he was talking about how he was first for it. And then he realized that uh, there would be a pulse of carbon produced from the cutting of all these forests. And uh, we don't have a budget for a pulse of carbon. Well, that's exactly what the, the industrialization of, ener of green energy is. It's gonna take a huge pulse, pulse of carbon infrastructure to create that amount of uh, so-called green energy mm -hmm. infrastructure. You know, a yeah. lot of smelting, a lot of uh, oh. ironworks, roads, yeah. cement, tons of cement, more cement. Uh, they estimate uh, like 10 uh, Hoover Dam's worth of cement will be need to be poured per day. Look, all the mining, rare all earth metals. The windmills. Uh, yeah, the mining know. of yeah. the rare earth minerals. Uh, the Philippines, they're about to mine one of the last strongholds of biodiversity for lithium. So it's in Oregon just is now being looked at for lithium. Yeah. And, you know, I, I read that like by 2030, 80% of the lithium will be used in electric cars. Think of how much energy it takes to push a car down the road. Is that the best way to, you, yeah. to use lithium? You know, we probably right. need to use some lithium. And yeah. is that the best like, way to use yeah. it? Pushing cars down the road. Where's the context? You know, if, if these technologies were in the context of conservation, uh, reducing industrial growth, everybody trying to, you know, reduce our de desires and demands on the planet, then, you know, maybe some lithium and, and some solar and all that is, 
you know, nobody, nobody wants to make people freeze in the cold or shut down hospitals. But uh, the plan well, now is, is more about economic growth. You know, you know, one thing that Lear Keith and, and Derek Jensen and Max Wilbert point out in Bright Green Lies is that the, the purpose of the mainstream Green New Deal, renewable energy, the purpose is to maintain, well, to maintain civilization by maintaining current levels of energy yeah. consumption. And, and I say, if, if, if 100, I think 100% renewable energy is a slogan, it's a pipe dream, but if it's possible, it'll only, it, it, it's more and more possible the more you lower the total energy consumption. 100% renewable energy becomes more achievable if you have less and less energy consumption. And yeah. if you have less energy consumption, it need not be a sacrifice for average people. If you look at who's using the energy, if the, you know, I I say reduce you know defense by 90 percent reduce the manufacture of new automobiles by 90 percent and i have a list of things that we can reduce by 90 percent that if you or the industrial agriculture eliminate nitrogen fertilizers they're they're like cocaine for plants yeah uh, and, and it takes like so much natural gas to fix the nitrogen in a chemical fertilizer it's just not needed it's it's like we if we eliminate we need to eliminate the things that people wouldn't want if they had a choice if you had an informed choice then there's so much that we have around us that we wouldn't need but the mainstream climate movement is not talking about this no no they don't emphasize conservation uh, and, you know, let's uh, try to, uh, you know, not, not make generalizations because I, I have many friends in the cl mainstream climate movement who are really dedicated and doing what they think is best. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think almost everybody in the climate movement is of good intention. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the problem is with journalism, you know, um, and uh, you know the elite level of of management of this paradigm. You know the people. You know when it, when the Democratic Party got behind this, that's when it really turned to being about jobs. You know um, Biden saying, "When I hear climate, I think jobs." You know, yeah. it was like, well, the coup was. You know, it was pretty much um, the whole narrative was lost by then, and. Uh, Politics is strange because people think, oh, well, we, we at least we got up to that high level, but you lost you lost the whole game in the process. You know, we've got this huge industrial infrastructure business going on. And, um, you know, I, I think it, it'd be worthwhile to, to have something on the infrastructure bill so people can try to figure out how to organize against it. If there's still some opportunity to keep money from going, you know, to some of these huge industries while preserving the important things I like, like uh, there is the Climate Conservation Corps um, and there is money for uh, uh, what they call human infrastructure, you know, uh, people who do care work. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm all for that. Uh, so, you know, if we can get, get it clear to people that they don't have to eliminate that kind of stuff, it's just let's quit funding industry, you know. Right. To... So yeah, I'm. I'll, I always say that you know, um, the. I mean, in Hart Hagen's perfect world, every step in the right direction is a step toward more freedom. And I mean, we, you know, if you look at the family budget and look at how much time we spend working for somebody else, working for systems that 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 control us i mean we spend this upwards of 21 we spend probably we've spent upwards of three thousand dollars per person each year on so-called defense and that's just the out-of-pocket costs we spend it takes on average eight thousand dollars a year to own and operate a car and you know I, I like saying that if you live in the country you need a car or a truck but look at how the city streets are crammed with cars. It's not a system that's designed for us. It's a system that's designed to extract wealth from us. 
So, yeah. and, and then there are other things uh, that in the family budget and in the government budgets that are just, we could easily eliminate half to three, easily, not easily, but we could eliminate half to three, four, you know, are we going to spend our time working for ourselves and one another, or are we going to spend our time working for the Pentagon and Wall Street? Well, they're talking about the big resignation, right? Like people are not going back to their jobs. They're finding that out. I, I find that very encouraging. Mm -hmm. You know, people are saying, no, I, I don't want to do that anymore. Uh, I've, I've had a chance to be home with my family <laughs> and fiddle in my garden. And uh, I don't want that life anymore. So we may be on more of a cusp of change than we think. <laughs> oh, Brian, yes. I've got a, yeah. Um... Uh, while I agree with so much of uh, what we're talking about here, that, that we sort of need to find a middle ground where uh, we can talk about reducing consumption and, uh, and, and changing the focus on endless growth in the economy. And um, what? Donut economics. Donut economics, my partner yeah. reminds me if you have heard of donut economics. Um, but um, I'm thinking about the, the fo our focus being water here. Um, are there ways that we can create economic growth, you know, and take the people that, that quit their job that they didn't want and find work for people that is productive, that does bring a return into the into the world's uh, material and energy economy. Um, yeah, there's there's tons of work for uh, building catchment, like Hart mentioned. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's physical work out in the woods, uh, great for young people, especially for uh, people of color who have been left out of the nature world, you know, the who have been stuck in cities all their lives. This gives an opportunity to give them employment, learning how soils work. Um, a lot of a lot of landscaping type work. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a huge opportunity for that. I do too. I do too. There may be there may be something for all we know in in the green in the um, build back better that actually is. There is there is direction. a little bit. It's the climate. I'm not sure it's climate conservation core, climate core maybe, but. Uh, it's a fraction yeah, of that. the total, though. It's it's not a lot compared to electrifying America. For and instance. there's uh, there's also um, I heard a lot of encouraging things about the agricultural policies that are in there. That um, hmm. I, I mean, who knows what will happen when it gets over to the Senate and they start, you know, the right. Monsanto lobbyists or whoever start tinkering with it. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean. Uh, how do we make water a strategic messaging issue That's now? That's a good question. Because um, when you look at, I mean, climate change is obviously happening, but a lot of the crises that we see are water phenomena. Right. They're, they're yeah. droughts and floods mm -hmm. and uh, hurricanes and- um, Heat waves. Which are soil phenomena, yeah. soil sponge loss. Yeah so that it, it feeds right into making soil a central issue and as a, as a buffer that, that protects us from both floods and drought. And, well, we're kind uh, of doing it. I mean, Hart's doing it with uh, water and climate. Um, you know, one thing I think we do need to do, uh, since it does seem like there's a community growing of people like us concerned about the biological climate, which is just a term I use, but, um, linking with environmentalists because um, environmentalists that I know when they learn about this immediately get it and immediately hmm. gravitate toward it, but they're just, they just don't know yet. Right. Uh, so a lot of education, you know, um, there's a lot of focus on direct action at times, you know, if a forest is going to be cut, yeah, go jump, climb the trees and try to stop it. But right now it seems like we just have a big education assignment figure out how to get people up to speed on this. Because we've all seen, once you start to learn it, it, it takes over, it's so interesting. And it's, it's so much good leads to so much more good that uh, it's, 
you know, kind of intoxicating. And very often, I mean, the, the things that you can get people excited about are issues that are right in their backyards, right? As opposed to mm -hmm. uh, who's, who personally is going to care about CO two if it's a gas that's distributed equally mm -hmm. around the, the globe, yeah. and uh, and you know, it's easy to think I'll reduce my carbon, but who's going to make anybody else do that? One thing I'm trying to do or going to be starting to do here is trying to figure out and map my local climate. You know, what is the climate of my region? You know, we're on the Pacific Northwest, right next to the ocean, big forests, and then prairie land, dry lands after the forest, you know, uh, trying to understand that climate. And then, because you can get people involved in local issues. Uh, if they feel like it's something they can relate to and they've been to, or they can see and imagine. Um, yeah, I really think that's, that's gonna have to be the future is uh, all of us healing our local climates will heal the global climate. And what we're getting is the opposite by healing the global climate, all our local climates will heal, but <laughs> I have very little faith in that. Right, the causal the causal arrow yeah. has to go in both directions. Exactly. Yeah. I have a couple of thoughts as far as, um, you know, the, the local aspect of it. Uh, in January, uh, um, let's see, Brian, you're in Boston. I talked with a Bostonian today and um, his name is Trevor Smith. And uh, he does stormwater projects. Um mm. And, you know, it's like how to capture stormwater and put it to good use. Um, and so we're, so the, that's an example of how can we empower small businesses to do good things. Um, it, by the same token, we have all this mowing going on. The manpower they get in, in, in money that gets put in, into mowing could be put into ecological landscaping. Yeah. And um, I'm not sure. I'm president of the local Native Plant Society. I, I talk about that, but I'm not sure how much. Uh, so I'm a little bit frustrated that I, I don't know. There's just something there. But I think it has to do with empowering small businesses and consumers to, you know, or it just just like the economic billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars are put into just okay show up and mow and mow yeah. and blow and instead and, of um, a more now, ecological uh, approach yeah right now it's yeah. the uh, leaf blower season yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> another thing like uh, let's let's uh let's direct a high power stream yeah. of air to, to to strip away the top layer of soil and blow mm -hmm. all the leaves in, put them in a truck and take them through yeah. the dump. Yeah. Uh, and then apply fertilizer. <laughs> what? And then apply fertilizer because you just took right, it right, all right. Away. Yeah, yeah. And malt, go, go to Home Depot and buy mulch that you just yeah. got rid of. Right. Right. Uh, well, it won't be solved overnight, that's for sure. But I do I feel like it's changing. I think Steve had his hand up a while okay. ago. Yeah, Steve. Um, as we were going through some of the um, different topics, uh, an article came to mind just talking about the the um, do good uh not do good -er, but the um, massive tree planting operations. They're putting in monocultures. Yeah. Um, eucalypts. Um, yeah. A handful of other yeah. things. Will they be harvested in 20 years? Are mm -hmm. they a fire risk that will go up one day with the climate changing? Will disease wipe through the whole lot? Um, yeah, That's quite flawed in my view. And they're, they're attracting public funds and capital from other people as well. So, yeah. That's what I yeah. thought when I... There was when I go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. Sorry. Um, yeah, there was an article shining light on that. So that's that's an important thing to say. We need to do better than monocultures if we want to have that benefit for the environment and carbon going forward. Right. Mm. 
there's this Civilian Conservation Corps that back in the New Deal era, the Civilian Conservation Corps planted a lot of trees. I'm sure they did some good. Um, I don't know the details, but in the United States, the U.S. Forest Service is in the timber business. They make money when they sell timber rights to companies that cut. So worst case scenario is that people is that we put people to work planting trees and somebody comes along 20 years later and harvests those trees. And it's just been it, it, it hasn't had a real ecological effect. It's just been kind of a pork barrel deal for for certain businesses. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Suzanne Simard has been writing some pretty uh, insightful things about that. Have any of you read uh, Finding the Mother Tree? Uh, no. no, I saw reference to it though. Uh, yeah, I, 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 would, I, I would read it. It's really uh, enlightening uh, about how forests work and why monocrops are just so really wrong biologically right. wrong. yeah and, and another thing that you hear like you know the in the media these little ideas get planted and the one idea that you know you'll read that oh young trees absorb carbon faster than old trees so let's just cut down the old trees and let the young trees grow because they're going to absorb carbon faster right, right. but uh, let's see gorshkov and makareva the russian scientists who pioneered the biotic pump theory emphasize that you need to keep the old forests intact, that it's the old forests that really uh, attract and make rain at greater rate. It's the whole forest yeah. ecosystem. It's not yeah. just trees growing. Right. And that's what Suzanne Simard shows, that without the mother trees, the younger trees will die. Hmm. And if you don't have a mixture of trees, they're only going to use a portion of the solar energy because, hmm. uh, you know, and, and the trees, like when a a fir is young, a birch growing faster is going to get more carbon and give it to the fir, you know, because there's all this trading underground, hmm. uh, but it'll also uh, shield the fir from direct sun. And then later the fir gets bigger than the, the birch. And, uh, but the birch played a role in helping the fir grow, you know? Yeah. Um, and one general that's principle- That's a big of... thing we're, we're coming to over and over with climate, from the biological perspective is com complexity and interlinking. Everything is interlinked. That, that old notion that everything is connected just keeps coming back and back. Yeah, uh, biodiversity is, uh, you know, biodiversity above ground leads to biodiversity below ground. You have your, if you have a, a mix, it, the optimally you have a, a good mix of native plants and trees above ground, and they're going to attract that, uh, that soil biology, uh, diversity of soil biology below ground. Yeah, yep, yeah. And that's good for soils and good soils are good for capturing rainwater, recharging groundwater, et cetera. As opposed to, you know, too often tree planting gets positive PR for politicians, for businesses, for neighborhood. And, and you know, some of the best people are involved in tree planting. I love my friends that are involved in tree planting. It's just, it's so easy to, it's glib. No, we just yeah. need to plant trees when, you know, we need to stop freaking cutting down the trees that we have for one thing. And when, when we do plant trees, I mean, are we doing it? Are we optimizing our resources? Are we yeah. spending a lot on a nursery grown tree or you can grow a good tree from seed if you'll stop for one thing, stop mowing it down. Uh, for another thing, if you can, you know, you maybe, but you know, a, a tree that's grown from seed will often overtake a nursery grown tree. Uh, you know, you, you think, oh, I'll start with this big tree. I'll be that much further ahead. Well, sometimes this tree that starts at the same time as a seedling will grow faster and be healthier. It has so, all that biology in the soil, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Also, uh, when we when we harvest trees, I mean, I'm not I'm not reflexively opposed to uh, cutting trees, but um, I think it's too we make it too easy for for um, logging to be clear cutting. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, there's the point you made about the you know you need those grandmother trees that that completely dominate the 
the fungal community in the ground, but also you can create a, a diverse uh, forest by cutting, when you cut a lot of trees to harvest them and leave enough that uh, there'll be pockets of shade and uh, the, the lower canopy can, can come up naturally. It, there's tremendous potential. It's just, I don't, I don't know why there's so as much clear cutting as there is, except that it's just an profitable. economic imperative. Yeah. When yeah, you give, give a guy with a chainsaw a chance, he's not going to want to turn down the biggest trees. Uh, Suzanne Samard, in her book, she talks about growing up uh, in the old days when they used horses and individually cut trees and they were living forests that were living, that were old and mature and stayed old and mature. And they would just take certain trees out and the forest did fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, there's also uh, issues of land use in, in lo logging because I know I lived in New Hampshire for a number of years and, and you would see the loggers go in uh, with big skitters and, and it was hilly country and they'd go straight up the hill and because that made it easy to pull the logs down. But um, it also made it easy to create brand new streams and wash away mm -hmm. a lot of soil and, and yeah. um, make a mess. Yeah. Mm. Yep. That makes uh, me think, uh, I was just gonna make a comment on yeah. Perhaps there should be certain slopes that we don't touch. Like that's certainly a permaculture principle. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know if there is in forestry. Presumably, there's a little bit of common sense in their management. But you know, if the, the tops of um, vegetated areas weren't touched, that'd go a long way in slowing water with that orographic um, rainfall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, do they um, have any um, re regulation on slope? Do you know? Uh, I'm not really up on, you know, uh, I do know that forestry is highly regulated and um, they are trying to do it better. Like the state leaves a minimum, I think, of 10 trees per acre, which isn't a lot, but they also are required to do stream buffers. Uh, but it's still basically clear cutting. Uh, and I think they may even do be still doing herbicide sprays afterwards, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. just the very last thing you want to do to a forest. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we need we need environmentalists to quit chasing windmills and start helping us. I think um, yeah, the the sun does a whole lot of. Uh, of good, the, when the sun shines on plants and when the sun shines on diverse ecosystems, including like a regenerative, a good regenerative farm is a diverse ecosystem. The sun yeah. just does a tremendous amount of work for us if we kind yeah. of work with nature instead of like, you know, just killing the goose that laid the golden egg, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the sun is going to you know, create a cooling effect. It's going to produce food. It's you know, produce timber. It's going to create a place for animals to live. And um, there needs to be some tending. Like you can't, you need to address invasive species sometimes. Um, you, you need to kind of try to build in some diversity. But um, I think one of the issues is, uh, you know, one of the issues is how how rich do you have to be before you you can't you can't cut down trees in our county anymore <laughs> um, uh, you know are, are, should there be limits on the uh, should localities I mean generally speaking we should have more ability to protect local businesses in the United States, you have the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution that has been interpreted to favor the multi, favor the out of state, out of town interests over the local interests. You have NAFTA and the World Trade. You have the World Trade Organization, which is radically and aggressively opposed to local protection yeah. and yep. in, in favor of so the, the uh, some of that needs to 
change, even if we can't change the laws, we need to kind of know, here's what we're going for. And we need to, you know, do what can be done, even if we can't get rid of the WTO right away. But, you know, we, protectionism should not be a bad word. Yeah. You know? What's wrong with protecting right. <laughs> things and people? It's like protecting things is bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, too often, does anybody the, the else regulatory... have anything to say that hasn't spoken? Lucy, how you doing? Oh, well, I mean, I've just listened to this. I mean, ever since I, I mean, I was, I volunteered with um, biodiversity down in DC, really, but um, I've just, I've sort of spent the last uh, month when I'm when I'm not weaving but just raking all my leaves and creating and layering it with um, leaves compost and seaweed and then I'm I'm oh. creating some new beds and covering those with tarps so that over yeah. the winter it will, will all um, decompose and I, I think the frustrating thing for me that because I've been involved with this is try to get my neighbors to understand that what we could do and it seems like that you know and talking about how we have to work locally is how how do we get our community to catch on to this so that we can do all these practices on a local and community level without them because i know we're getting this whole solar farm on mount desert island and we're going all in that direction but nobody's talking as much about um, the things well, what are your what are your neighbors? What do you think is their biggest resistance? Is it laziness? Um, they don't. They, I don't think they see it as that um, that important. They don't see it as a real solution. That that's yeah. the impression that I get when I try to talk about it. I mean, I have a name, and he's perfectly in I mean, He's a doctor at the hospital, and he likes to garden. And every time I get going on <laughs> soil water, he just looks, he looks at me like, a, how could I possibly know anything? And I, I actually get kind of offended, you know? Yeah. And then, I, you know, and then I don't, and then I just proceed to carry on, you know, and do what I'm doing. But well, um, that's the scientific basis in society. You know, they you know, uh, the CO2 thing was sold, uh, well, and it's legitimate. I mean, it was presented by Michael Mann, who's from Nassau. So, oh, well, he's from Nassau, he must know. Whereas somebody who understands soil, well, they're just a hippie, you know, who likes to play. <laughs> right? So there's a lot of cultural bias here. Yeah. You know, if, if it ain't big tech, it, it ain't serious, right? Right. Well, that's it's people point. are militant about this. I mean, I'm I feel like I'm sort of perceived as kind of weird because I'm out with this broken rake and I'm trying to aerate my lawn. <laughs> and I, <laughs> you're the most normal of the group, right? Because you yeah, know your actual the, land, how it works. It's just like it's a little frustrating at times. It is. Well, one yeah, thing that I have a uh, controls, solution, actually. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to think. I was just going to say. I think we get ourselves a bunch of white coats and some clipboards. And, um, <laughs> that's a great idea. Uh, we just need to wear white coats and have clipboards, pocket pals, lots of pens. <laughs> I've been thinking lately about the influence of science fiction. So we have generations and generations of science fiction that has kind of uh, it, 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 it has. Um, we have this sense of inevitability as to what the future looks like and that, you know, space travel is good and, and every of uh, the industrialized <laughs> medicine is, is good. And of course, yeah. everybody needs an electric car because that's a step forward. And Soon we'll be um, flying in cars, right? Yeah. That's the right. next step. I mean, where's my Jetsons car, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, somebody's building it right now. I guarantee you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe getting government in. grants. Yeah, that, that's tied in with the. Uh, I, I don't. I can't prove this, but I, I think there's probably some link between that and the military-industrial complex. I, I know that if you have a pro-war movie, you're going to get subsidized by the Pentagon. 
if you have an anti-war movie, you're on your own. Yeah. So there's this, you know, there's this mix of movies that are that glorify all this technology and the superhero movies, of course, glorify yeah. technology. And uh, yeah. Well, I should probably run because I'm borrowing a friend's uh, living room for this. <laughs> and they probably need to get their tell, dinner tell going. them we got important business to do <laughs> <laughs> well they know that that's why they gave me their living room <laughs> yep. thanks so much for presenting rob yeah yeah thanks for having me Hart. and thanks good to talk with you all and good to see everybody we'll, we'll stay in contact okay. good to see you, Brian. climate okay good night okay. everyone good night good night So Steve, how, you're you're in Australia. You're on mute. Yeah. Yep. Friday, Friday mid morning. Yeah. Kids are on school holidays, so yeah. Um, busy. Mm. So it's uh, it's a uh, springtime there. Um, summer. Summer. Yeah, December summer. So okay. Yeah. We just had our. First, first decent drop of rain yesterday. We got 40 mil of rain, mm -hmm. 40 millimeters. Yeah. What part of That's Australia exciting, are you in? What part of Australia? I'm west of Cairns. West of Cairns, up north, far north Queensland. Okay. So um, there's rainforest down the road and we're more tropical savanna. Hmm. So um, definite wet and dry season. Yeah. And hence my strong interest in water and climate and soil and all things because water is everything here with a we've got like a seven month dry season and um mm. probably probably about three months of intense rain and then little bits for the other couple of months so mm. mm -hmm. yeah super important stuff what, what have you been doing about like capturing rain and uh what are you going to be doing going forward? What do you What do you got going on? Uh, my main agenda is that um, it's the maximum infiltration bunyip pumps um, thing, which I'm keen to um, do with you one day, Hart. Um, yeah. Just trying to. I'm pretty eager and just, but I think this time I'll just give it that little bit more development. Talk to a few people on the modelling of it. Um, very simple premise. And um, yeah, I'm excited for that, and that's um, and keen to share that idea. Um, for those who don't know, it's it's using fuelless pumps to give soil long infiltration times is the basic premise. So, um, okay. Um, yeah. I this is the first time I've seen you on video, so now I'm connect now I'm connecting mm -hmm. the face with the name and the previous conversations we had. So there's this video that I saw that is very similar. It, it sounds similar. I'm sure it's different, but it's similar to what you're talking about in the sense that it's a, it's an Andrew Millison video. It's part of a seven part mm -hmm. series called India's water revolution. And the second uh, of that series, they, they have a problem with that there, there's this catchment and there's a holding pond in in the upper part of the catchment but somehow that it doesn't translate into groundwater because that holding pond has a rock bottom mm -hmm. so what they did was that they ran pipes from that uh down into some other ponds and the, these these ponds below uh they would you know, they would dry up during the dry season. But if you feed them water from throughout the dry season, then it recharges mm -hmm. the groundwater and recharges the wells. And that sounds mm -hmm. like it has some similarities to what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. Sounds like it. I'll have to have a look at that. I've seen quite a few of his videos. Um, yeah, that sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a massive advantage. Um, like it's all about infiltration rates here. Um, heavy clay and intense rain. We don't get the freeze thaw cycles that you guys have to build up soil structure and organic matter because it all cycles much faster. 
Um, yeah, so having that advantage of releasing it over a long period of time and that pumping ability. Um, yeah, I'm excited by the idea and quite a few other people are, which is great. And um, yeah, get it out to engineers. And I'm keen to just share the idea broadly. Um, some people were encouraging a commercialization strategy to protect the idea from vested interests. Um, and I've pursued that a little bit, talking to someone, but I don't think I've got the um, the personal skills um, to do a good job of commercialising that. So I just thought, well, I'll, I'll share it to um, well-intended people. And, um, you know, if people get excited by it, great. They can, um, you know, projects around the place that are independent of me would be great because there's some people doing some incredible work and super ambitious work. Have you seen the um, like one one group that I shared it with? Have you seen that um, Sinai um, Lake Bellowell or something? Um, there's a 600 kilometer square lake in the Sinai Peninsula that they're planning on dredging to get the um, to get tidal movements and and um, yeah, super bright people, engineers and. I thought they'd be quite attracted to this when, when all you've got to work with is extreme runoff, having mm -hmm. that chance to um, extend that is a massive advantage. Right. Yeah. Of course. That sounds great. So, yeah. Yeah. So I'll try and develop it as much as I can. So it's um, as coherent as possible. And then I'd love to share it with um, yourself and others there. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Just let me know so, when you're yeah. ready. Thanks, Hart. Um, yeah, apart from that, just pot around. Um, yeah, they've got four kids under 10, so that um, keeps me out of trouble. Right. <laughs> I understand. Everything's sort of half assed, really. <laughs> <laughs> any, any project gets damaged quickly, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, uh, I appreciate your time, appreciate you coming and participating, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Enjoy it. Thanks, Hart. All right, Steve. Have a good day. Bye-bye. You too. See ya.